I was taking up the issue, so to speak, from the down end. Not say how many million, half millions is a small country. I went to the bottom. 10,000, 20,000, 60,000, 100,000, 200,000. Can such countries have diplomats? And if those diplomats are there, how should they be? What can they do? Are they of any use at all? Uh, 20 years ago, the answer would simply have been no. Uh, and we can take the example of very small states, old ones in Europe, like Liechtenstein or Monaco. They had practically no diplomats of their own. Uh, they relied on a big neighboring country to defend their interests internationally, Switzerland in the case of Liechtenstein, France in the case of Monaco. But information and communications technology has created a new situation where smallness is not equivalent with impossibility of being present on the international scene. Uh, if you only set up a national website, and I think there's no state left in the world that has not a national website, then you have already a big instrument of presence, of also diplomatic presence. And that website can uh, open access, for instance, for uh, requests for visas and things like that. Singapore has been the uh, uh, pioneer in this field. But now we also have the uh, virtual embassy and the virtual consulate. Now, what does that mean for these countries? A virtual embassy is a website uh, where the people at the foreign ministry handle the relations with a specific state. And the desk officer within whose competence falls that state is also the accredited ambassador to that particular country. He stays at home except for short visits to the countries to which he has been accredited as ambassador. But from all those countries, there is easy access to him through the virtual embassy website. And through that website, uh, it is easy to know what that country does. And with the consular system, it's even simpler because uh, you can have consular websites always geared to specific places where the consular circumscription is. The problem, of course, is that uh, there is a lack of physical interaction. Now, uh, a virtual embassy can have one diplomat in the receiving country, at least in the main receiving country. And that diplomat is not an ambassador, is not expensive, but can cultivate the kind of personal contacts that are required in any kind of diplomacy. Uh, the virtual consulate can be uh, helped by the establishment of a honorary consul. Honorary consul, as you know, costs nothing. And this honorary consul will be the interface between the virtual consulate website and actually the users. Because especially in these small and poor countries, immigrants mostly are not very sophisticated and they may not be able or willing because they are old to use uh, a, a computer. So if they have to be catered for, there has to be a physical human being, the honorary consul, to be the interface between these people and uh, the uh, computer. Now, what does that mean in terms of diplomats? The diplomats of countries who have to rely mainly on this approach are two in one. That is, the same person is the desk officer and is the representative abroad. This is the shortest possible uh, communication link that you can think of, which also means that this person is involved both 
in making the policy and in implementing it and thereafter in mon monitoring its outcome. So this person, of course, has a number of countries within his desk officer area, which means that this person must be able to quickly adjust to everywhere. And those who are desk officers for multilateral issues, uh, of course, it's the same system. And they must be able to switch from subject to subject, because it's one person, maybe, doing, dealing with the United Nations. And this one person, even if he does not go to New York, even if he has no physical presence, because nowadays, in bigger conferences, you have the possibility of virtual presence. And uh, so, it may be not going there, but he, if he wants to make any impact whatsoever, he must understand the issues being discussed. 